All right. Good evening, everybody. So, have you ever been really nervous for something, and then someone comes alongside you and says, they've probably done it before, and they go, don't be nervous, it's fine. Just, it's, it's cool, just do it, right? right? Well, I have two kids now. I have a four and a seven-year-old, and they get nervous and scared all the time to ride, learn how to ride a bike, jump in a pool, speak in front of their class, right? And I did the same thing. Don't be nervous, it's fine, because I've done it before. I can ride a bike, it's fine. And then I realized something my wife told me. She said, why don't you say instead, actually, it's okay, be nervous, be afraid, and do it anyway, right? So I get this email from Max to come here, and I'm doing it anyway. All right, so get that out of the way. So first of all, I'd like to say thank you to Max. What's that? Stay back where you're at, fighting line. Okay. I say thank you to Max and to Dave um, for bringing me in tonight. I'm really excited to be here. Um, I did graduate 10 years ago, um, but I really, really enjoyed this program. Um, I really enjoyed what we learned, how we grew, and the network that was created out of that. And you guys should all be really proud and happy to be here um, in general with this program. So I just want to say thank you to all the professors, but especially to Max and to Dave here tonight. So I am. Right now, I am a chair designer. Um, I more affectionately like to call myself a chair nerd. Um, I'm currently a product design manager for a seating manufacturer. And I came in actually today, um, this, this morning, or actually not this morning, but before this, and I love flipping chairs upside down to see how they're made. And I was the first one in here, and I was flipping these upside down. Right? So you should all do that later. Um, Max Stackers and the SW1 Lounge which then Dave and I got to talk about. But I'm a chair nerd, I love chairs, chairs are awesome. I'll be like in the hospital waiting room and I'm flipping chairs upside down and people think I'm crazy. Um, <laughs> all right, so, so okay, so why am I here? Why am I here, good question. Why am I here? So when I was thinking about what to say, um, Max emailed me three weeks ago and I said yes before I could think about it to say no, but uh, I thought about what I was going to say, and I realized some interesting ideas and thoughts that I had, so I want to share them with you before I go into this. So, have you heard the phrase in negotiation, um, the first person's name of price loses? Heard that? Okay. How about the phrase, um, maybe more of the positive side, but um, good leaders or good listeners? Maybe? Okay, yeah. So, I was sitting here tonight thinking, well, I'm the one up here talking, and you guys are listening, which means you guys are the ones in control which means it's not about me, it's about you. And it kind of started changing my perspective about what to talk about and even you guys sitting in those chairs. And so as you go through these last few years of school, maybe think about that when you go into your classrooms. The professors have probably been through this over and over and over again. It's about your growth, it's about your learning and being challenged to, to get better, right? So that's kind of what I'm trying to bring tonight, maybe a little bit of a new perspective. So. Okay, so my name is Eric McDonald. Um, I'm an industrial designer. I graduated in 2009. Um, and basically, I want to say one thing and maybe ask you guys a question. Where would you rather be right now? Anybody? Where would you rather, Dave? Anybody? Asleep. Asleep, okay. Anyone else? <laughs> Nothing? Where would you rather be right now? One more person, come on. Cuba, okay, awesome. I was hoping someone would say nowhere else, but no one said that. So I would rather be here. So I love being outside, and I know horrible segue, Dave laughed, but he told me to keep him awake tonight, so that's the goal. So I'd rather be here. So for me, I think we are inside too much. I love being outside. I love the contrast and taking that in, the contrast of life. We're inside so much, we sit down so much, but when's the last day that you went through life without sitting in the chair or sitting in something, right? Interesting. Um, the ch a chair, I th again, I'm a chair nerd. The chair, I think, is uh, one of the oldest inventions. In fact, what's the greatest invention? The wheel, right? I like to think that the person that came up with the wheel was sitting in a chair <laughs> when they came up with the wheel. Maybe, right? Maybe. So anyway, so I wanted to kind of talk about that a little bit. but. Um, before I go any further, I'll say that there's going to be kind of two parts to this. I want to take you through my journey out of school, um, going into where I'm at now, so, so kind of how I got where, right? And then the other half will be kind of how I think and some of the um, things that have happened kind of in my life that have now um, infused how I think in, as a designer, right? Okay, so how do I think? So as I start, 
How do I think? Who's this guy? Anybody? No? From G.I. Joe? Duke? There we go. We have a hand. Is it General Hawk? Or? It's Duke. Duke from G.I. Joe. OK, so what's the phrase? It's, let's see, uh, now you know and knowing is half the battle, right? Sound familiar? So my boss, my current boss, loves flipping things on its head, right? And we're walking down a hallway in Las Vegas for a trade show, and we're there, and we're, everything's kind of crazy, and we're thinking about things for the next day. And he says to me, what if not knowing is half the battle? And I was like, oh, that's interesting. He just kind of left that thought and walked away. It's like, well, that doesn't make any sense. What is not knowing is half the battle? But I, that's actually now my favorite phrase, is not knowing is half the battle, because it makes you think that maybe admitting that you don't know is actually the hardest part than learning that you need to learn something new. Right? So for me, not knowing is half the battle as of right now. And my second favorite character, Neo. Anybody? Okay, so Neo had in the first movie in The Matrix, right, back in 99, I, I believe when it came out, had like 160 lines, right? 94 of them were questions. Dude asked questions all the time. <laughs> all the time. All the time. But he's my favorite character, he's always asking questions, right? And so for me, I like to ask questions. I like to find what the best questions are, hit those out, listen, ask more questions, right? And basically, I probably annoy a lot of people that I work with because I do this constantly, and my wife. But I like asking lots of questions. I think that's really important in your design thinking. So OK, so how did I get here? So, OK, I graduated in 2009. Wasn't a great job market. Um, my very first job out of school was the job that I had in school. I was a valet still, because I couldn't find a job. I was a valet for eight years through school. But what I wanted to say is that if you have a customer service job, there's an interesting thing you can learn about people and about interpersonal conflict through customer service. So the customer is always right. No, that's crazy. But that's the, the phrase. Well, what about the client, when you have a client? Is the client always right? No, of course not. I mean, they're paying you, right? But is the client was right? No. But you kind of got to make them feel that they are, maybe. Same kind of similar thing. Is your boss always right? If he's here, yes, absolutely, the boss is always right. He, I don't think he's here. So no, of course, you're right. So is the boss always right? So I was there for you know, six months out of school. It was really difficult to find that first job. Um, and there's an interesting thing that happened to me. Every job I had since then for the past 10 years has been from a um, a referral, but a referral where someone had called me, and it was someone that I knew in school. It was an old mentor I might have had, or someone else. I don't even like saying the word network, but it was that. It, it literally was that, right? So about six months later, um, at, after this, my very first design job was at this company called Versa Tables. They were in Gardena, and all I was doing was taking, excuse me, taking AutoCAD files and translating them to SolidWorks files. That's all I did, right? Um, but there's a funny kind of question when you, you get asked this a lot in school, is uh, would you rather work in a small design consultancy or would you rather work at a large firm in-house, right? And my answer now is yes. And the reason why the answer is yes is because it can be more about the people than the work. It can be more about the culture than the work, right? You can find the meaning in the culture and the people that you're, you're around and you're with. Um, this was a very interesting um, kind of thrust into the fire. Uh, there was a manufacturing facility right there. I learned a lot, did as much as I could um, while I was there. I was only there for about maybe six months to a year. Um, ended up having a performance review, and the person that was reviewing me as my superior didn't know what industrial design was. So I was like, oh, that's, oh, that's OK, I'm sorry. And I had to kind of go through this whole challenge. Learned a lot. It was great. Got a call, went to my next company. The next company was Design Catapult in Fountain Valley, a great company, a small design firm whole different idea there. They worked on so many random projects, really fun, really a lot of amazing things. But I want to show you guys this. So this was an existing product from Pentair. Pentair came to Design Catapult and said, hey, we have this little shark. It's an above ground pool cleaner. And we want this to be redesigned with a new look. But we want it to look like a little shark, since the name. It was a very popular product for them. So I went through the whole design process for the first time ever, and now as a professional, going from sketch all the way through, concept rendering all the way to SolidWorks, even to tooling, and made my very first finally successful product. It was a little shark, actually a little shark, right? My favorite part about this was that he's very happy 
that he's eating all your leaves, so he's not too intimidating, but he's also staring at you while he's doing it because he's down at the bottom of the pool. But anyway, that was fun. <laughs> that was a fun, fun project to kind of go through and work on, um, and it's still on the market. Um, I gotta get one. I don't have a pool. I have a kiddie pool. I'm gonna put it in there. Anyway, so I, yeah, that was really fun. So from that point, um, so again, remember, like I said, everything was, um, someone was kind of making the request, right? Uh, something, one thing I live by is never burn any bridges, right? You never know where that request is gonna come from, right? So the next request was, I started to work for this company called Warrior Engineering. This was a startup, um, so it was basically the head guy who started the company. It was me as the director of design, which sounded really nice, and it was one other guy in the shop. And this was a very crazy six months for a startup. So I worked at a factory, I worked at a small design firm, and I worked at this startup. And I learned a ton. I wore every hat under the sun. And I learned that I don't ever want to work in a startup ever again, because that was really, really challenging. But I learned a ton. And so I kept coming back to, um, kept coming back to the senior shows. And I, and I kept coming back year after year, and kept in contact with people, see how they're doing. Um, and I came across an, a mentor that I had while I was in school. His name was Ernesto Quinteros. And he was the head of design at Belkin at the time. He is now the chief design officer at Johnson & Johnson. Um, but I, I came across him, and, and we started catching up um, at the show. And uh, basically, he said to me, he said, so what are you doing? I told him I'm director of design. He's like, oh, cool. And he's like, well, what's really you doing? And I kind of explained the whole situation. And he said, OK. He's like, well, who's speaking into your life as a designer? I was like, hmm, I don't know. And he said, who around you, who do you work with, who is, who's around you that's better than you as a designer? I was like, uh, I don't know, and he kind of just left it there, and then we changed subjects, and my head just like exploded that night. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> and so I realized how much growth there can be in s intentionally surrounding yourself with people that are better than you, right, to grow and to learn. And that really all comes back around to, you know, not knowing is really half the battle, right? You have to kind of let the ego go, try and get around a place that's going to help you grow and challenge you constantly. It's like the hard road, basically, right, to, to do that. Um, so that led me to basically a phone call about a month later, actually a guy I graduated with um, who worked at Belkin at the time and said, hey, we are starting a brand new position um, called structural packaging design. I was like, yeah, sure, let's do this. I wanted to be in that design department um, at Belkin. So that led me to Belkin and I actually went to my interview, um, showed you know, the, the portfolio, showed all the sketches, showed all the work all the design process and everything, and, and I'm about to leave, and I think it went well. And the person interviewing me um, was Oliver Seal. Um, he's now the head of design there, he's an amazing designer. And he looks at me and he goes, well, do you like uh, cutting paper and taping it together? I'm like, yes, I mean, okay, <laughs> yes, as much as the next designer does, right? And I kind of walk away, I'm like, I, I don't know, what do I do now? I'm driving home, and I remember that in Design 280, the Articulating Cube project was videotaped by Dave Tubner. And I was like, I should put that on YouTube and send him the link. So I did. I, got, I uploaded it that night, I sent it to him, and that's me with a lot more hair and no beard and no glasses. So it was a long time ago. But I sent it to him, and I, I kid you not, I think that's what got me the job. Maybe not, I don't know, but I think it was. So that's crazy, right, that that one project did it. But it was documented and it went really well for me. So you never know what project is gonna be that could be that foot in the door for that next thing, and that one thing they want to see that get you there, right? So that really led me to structural packaging design, which led into what we called packaging experience design for Belkin, which was an amazing experience. Um, we basically got to work with the marketing team, the branding team, work with sales, work with program managers, the entire industrial design team there, and come up with ways to have the most best out-of-box experience for these products that they were coming up with. This is a car charger um, that was exclusive in the Apple Store. And this was probably one of the funnest things and best, biggest things I worked on there um, while I was at Belkin. Um, but the interesting thing about the Apple Store and a lot of stuff that was going in the store from a packaging standpoint was that the product had to be um, touched, be able to be touched by the customer, right? So when you walk in, you have to be able to open something up and play with it and put it back. Well, when you're selling cables, 
that's like a nightmare. You open a box and the thing just falls on the ground and now what? You kind of try and stuff it back in, right? So that was a really, really, really big challenge, how to package those things so nicely and hold them so tightly and cleanly and present it well. Um, and I show this too because this was a time when I think that the design of the package perhaps influenced the design of this product, which was the pouch on the left side. Um, if the designer of the pouch was here, he'd say the different. But <laughs> the, the racetrack shape and the idea of that and how many times that would loop around so that the lightning cable was actually perfectly vertical right on that side determined the radius I needed that then I think had the um, radius on the pouch. I don't know, maybe we'll see. He would argue with me on that one. But that was a really fun project. Um, led to big uh, family of products, series of products um, for Belkin, but in the Apple store. Um, got to present to Apple. And that was really, really fun and really challenging and, and quick turnover. In that world, too, of, of structural packaging design, if you will, you can affect things very quickly. Um, I am now in the furniture industry. and. The shortest thing is like a year and a half. Um, we've done things that take three years long to develop, right? And it's a chair. Um, but with this, within three months, there's things on the peg. And it was just a really amazing experience. So I kind of let myself open the door to those ideas and those thoughts and to be around those kinds of people at Belkin. Um, this was a screen protector application device that the entire engineering team at Belkin came up with um, through help and assistance with the program and sales management, right? And they came up with this amazing device to basically make every Apple employee a ninja at putting on screen protectors. You basically toss the phone in, you slide a thing, and it goes on, right? It's really, really cool, really amazing. But then the challenge was from a packaging experience design and the ID team, hey, how do you launch this now in the Apple retail environment? So we went out, we did a lot of research. I was fortunate enough to actually go to Hong Kong for this trip. And this is a giant Apple store in Hong Kong, it's two stories. And I got to go and just observe. I got to go and watch and see things and see how things were done and experience just the craziness of that large of a store. And if you'll notice, there's two stories and there's this really amazing stairwell right in the middle connecting them. So I'm standing on the top floor and I'm kind of watching and observing. And I noticed there's an a employee, a woman, carrying like three laptops or lots of product. She's coming by me and she goes down the stairs. And then she's delivering to whoever downstairs, right? And about 10 minutes later, here she comes again from the other side down the stairs. And then again, down the stairs, all with product. I'm like, wait a second. She's not coming back up the stairs, right? She's basically wanting to show off how much stuff is being purchased and how cool it all is. As she's, she's basically taking like the warm cookies that smell great and walking them through the store, right? So it's like, how do you take that idea and that experience and bring it into this crazy, crazy environment, especially in this type of a, a um, location? So if you've been to Chili's, <laughs> you order the fajitas, yeah? <laughs> no, yeah. So next time you go, order the fajitas. And when they start to come out, don't look at them. Do your best. Not look at them. But look at everybody else, right? It's a big game. They don't have to make that sizzle sound, right? It's a big game. Look at everyone else. They're all going to do this, every single person. So I was like, well, how could we actually do that? Could we create a, a unit that gets brought out and it becomes like this magic show, if you will, in front of people to sell more little pieces of plastic that go on your phone? check the screen, right? Not very exciting. And it seemed to work really well. Um, this is us training some employees. Um, but the employees all became very um, proud of it. And, and in a way, they took ownership of it, which is a big deal there, too. Their customer service is absolutely amazing. So we needed them to buy into this idea and the system. So that's kind of the story uh, with Belkin. And what I will say, too, is um, this whole time, I've I've always had a love for, for furniture and for chairs and for other things. And I was always um, working at night. I mean, I was always trying to do things and explore and see um, you know, what the future could hold. So I was working on project like, projects like this. Through these types of projects that I was working on at night, um, I did these projects a lot um, in tandem with Joe Riccio. Uh, professor that used to be um, here. And 
through these contacts, I ended up getting more and more freelance work, contract work, step, step, step. Till finally, um, I started doing some freelance for my current company, which was OM. And OM called me up and they said, hey, why don't you just come in full time? We don't have a designer yet. We want you to come in and be our very first product designer in-house. So I became the product design manager for OM. Um, in fact, it's kind of funny. So we are in Ontario. The, the plant is in Ontario. I live in Rancho Cucamonga. I grew up in Orange County, and I lived in LA for a long time. And my wife and I always joke that we would move outside of California, and I kind of feel like we did, because we're way out there. We're in San Bernardino County, so it's kind of nice. But I did want to show you guys a video of a little bit about our company. So what's been really great about working with this company, um, OM, OM Seating, or OM Smart Seating, um, the company actually used to be uh, called Office Master. About 10 years ago, they rebranded to OM. So they're 30, about 33 years old now, and their history and their legacy is ergonomic task seating, which is a very uh, complicated world of adjustments and features and ergonomous and kind of crazy. So about the first 20 years, that was their foundation, was ergonomic task seating. But there wasn't a lot of design infused into that. They were just solving problems for the user. Um, they, were, they had great you know, customer service, great warranties, great weight ratings, the whole deal. So then about 10 years ago, they started getting contract designers to come and do projects for them. This is chair is called Truly. But what's been so great now is that now that I'm in-house, we have one other designer in-house too, industrial designer from here. Um, we've been able to now infuse on top of the history of ergonomic task seating uh, design as well. So it's been really great to have that core foundation and then now come in on top of that. And I feel really fortunate to be a part of that, that moving forward. And the contract furniture market can be kind of stuffy in a way. Um, we don't take ourselves too seriously. We obviously have paper airplanes flying around in one of our ads. Um, and uh, so that's been really fun too. Again, remember I talked about a while ago, it was uh, a lot about the culture and about who you're working with. And OM, they claim to be a family, and I think that they really are, they truly are, um, which has just been really, really great. Um, so yeah, keep an eye out for that too as you move through your careers. Um, and I just wanna show this picture, this was really fun. I was there for this photo shoot, but I think it's off the hook. Um, all right. Thank you, Max, appreciate it. Okay, so, yeah. No, okay, sorry, I apologize. I'm really sorry for that. Okay, so this chair, this chair is called Ginny. And this chair was my very first chair ground up design at OM. And it's very simple, very basic um, in a way. In fact, um, it was kind of my baby. This took about a year and a half to develop, um, literally from the glides all the way up. And I'll tell you a story about this later on in kind of the second half of what I want to talk about tonight. Um, but this was really fun that they gave me the opportunity to do this. They don't do a lot of side chairs, to, uh, this mostly task chairs. Um, but it was really neat to, the, the challenge was basically how do you make something that is somewhat universal in its look, but still look very nice and contemporary and current. That was a really challenging thing to do. Um, from a designer standpoint, I think I hit it with a few key elements. It's really small elements. Um, some people, it's just another four-legged side chair, but that's okay. I will say too, part of the reason why I love chairs so much, and it kind of happened earlier today, was every person, no matter what, has an opinion 
about a chair that they sit in for the very first time. And the thing is, is it's a valid opinion with comfort, feel, right, all of that. And so it's really challenging. It's kind of a double-edged sword. But every single person that sits down has a valid opinion. So I designed something like this, and now I have to hear people's thoughts every single time someone sits in it. And it's kind of an interesting thing how that learns, how that grows and, and goes inside of me. Um, but again, I'll talk more about that a little bit later. This is our latest chair, kind of switching gears a little bit into a, a new market for us. This is called Worksy, and this was really fun. We think it's the first height adjustable, swiveling, rocking shell chair. We, I swear we didn't just try and add a bunch of things on. It's actually kind of interesting. It's fun to sit in. Um, it's, it's been a really interesting uh, talking piece to get new conversations started. And it's interesting too, sometimes uh, for us and sometimes to get a new conversation started, you have, to, you have to be fresh, you have to be new, and you have to sh be appealing and show something that's just going to start that conversation. You might still end up buying the mesh back task chair, but you don't want to lead with that. Right? So you can kind of get, take that idea maybe into when you're going into an interview or when you're showing portfolios or whatever, right? you got to lead somehow. You don't want to give it all away right in the beginning, but you want to pull them in and that's what this is doing for us as a company right now. And this is an ad that we came up with for Worksy. We like paper airplanes, I guess. So that was really fun uh, to develop and be a part of. Um, in fact, at the, uh, the shoot for that, there was the director on the Steadicam, and he was running through the scene of people doing stuff. And there was a person holding a giant pole with a fishing line and like a wad of gum on the end. And that's where they were going to track their eye as they were watching. And then they superimposed the plane, obviously, through the whole thing. So they, that was take after take after take was a guy running through as fast as he could with the Steadicam. Really fun to do that. Um, so that's, that's kind of Worksy, that's the story of Worksy and kind of how that all happened. But again, it's, it's been really fun. Um, we have a lot of output for, I think, a small team um, at the company. And so I just want to say that, you know, it, you don't really know what you're getting yourself into from face value. Um, you don't really know until you get there and try something. And that's kind of been true in almost every job that I've had. Um, I kind of have this motto of just, you go 110% into something. That way, if you make a mistake, you have, you're going fast enough to just turn around and keep going, hopefully make it out in time. Um, but I always just charge ahead and give it all that I have. And so in this picture is literally the entire team from marketing to branding to design to the president to operations to the factory. In fact, the president is the happiest guy in the photo, <laughs> which is great. Um, OK, so that kind of leads me into actually uh, what I wanted to talk about tonight. So we'll say that was the intro. Just kidding. <laughs> OK, so everyone's still awake. Dave's still awake. This is good. We're doing good. Um, OM right now is trying to put together uh, this idea called OM Discussions and talk about different things um, and basically have a little bit of a lecture series of their own. And the first topic is going to be empathy and design. So for about the past month, I've got to kind of think through what that means and think through how, how that works and what is empathy and design. And so it started making me think. Um, empathy, or basically walking a mile in someone's shoes, right? It's an amazing design tool to, to really understand problems and solutions for uh, what, you might need, what you might need to solve a problem, right? Um, the de definition, right? The ability to understand and share the feelings of another, right? So really amazing design tool. In fact, if you haven't researched it, you absolutely have to. But I started thinking about it some more, and I thought, well, wait a second. There's no real call to action with empathy. You get a solution, so your call to action might be, I have to do this because my boss told me to, or I need to make money, or 
I, I just love making cool things, right? So for me, in a way, it kind of maybe stops one step short. Um, and again, it's somewhat maybe semantics potentially, but I think compassion, sympathetic pity and concern for the sufferings or misfortunes of others, I think if you look at it from that perspective, you actually can have a reason and a meaning to doing something in your designs. And I'm talking from the smallest thing to the largest thing, right? I mean, making sure the correct caster is designed on my chair so that it works well on a smooth surface versus carpet. You want that user's experience to be really good. That's really, really small scale, but why couldn't that be a reason to find meaning in what you do throughout all of your, your design career, right? So instead of empathetic design, I'm starting to think this way, what if it's called compassionate problem solving, right? Or if I was gonna rename now my speech, so I said I was starting over, I'm now, this is the secret name, Conflict, Compassion, and Chairs. So hi, my name's Eric McDonald. I'm just kidding. I got Dave to laugh, yes, I can go now. Okay, so Conflict, Compassion, and Chairs, right? So the idea that conflict, right, in your designs, what's the problem that you're gonna solve, right? That's the simple way to say it, but why not actually dive in deeper and go, what's the conflict, what's the real conflict, right? How then do you find the user? Well, the user, you need to have compassion for them if you want to solve it well and have that idea of helping somebody, right? So conflict and passion, and for me, it happens to be chairs. So I'm going to take you through a couple ideas that kind of represent this. Does anyone know what plane this is? Yes, yeah, say it. Blackbird Yes, awesome. So technically, this is the plane that came just before it. It's called the A12 ox cart. And this was developed by Skunk Works, Lockheed, and the CIA at Area 51. It's an amazing story, right? Well, this plane, uh, oh, they called it Oxcart because this plane was the fastest thing ever, Mach 3, 2,000 miles per hour, and the Oxcart is the slowest thing ever, so they thought it was funny, so they called it Oxcart. So it's the A12 Oxcart. So this thing has these amazing engines in it. Each one has enough power to push the Queen Mary. And when they were developing it, these test pilots, as they were flying for the first time ever, going from Mach 2 to Mach 3, had this weird thing happen to them. It was called an unstart. So what would happen is one of the engines would just shut off. And they're flying through the air at almost 2,000 miles per hour. So when one engine shuts off, the entire plane would just turn sideways, and they'd bang their head up against the cockpit, right, or the canopy. And this happened over and over and over again, and the engineers were like, it's fine, just, you'll just restart the engine and move on, it's fine. So finally, and they never crashed in that instance, there was other things, whatever, but not this, it's a great story. Anyway, so one time, one of the pilots hit his head really hard and had a big dent in his helmet. So he landed the plane, went to the head engineer, slammed his helmet on the desk and said, fix this, right? Meaning the unstart problem. So they basically had this head engineer start to train to fly in this plane. Do the physical training, the G training, and this whole thing, right? The dude freaked out and was like, there's no way I'm doing that. That's crazy. I will fix this problem for you. And this was this idea of like he needed to basically understand and have enough compassion for the pilot, the test pilot. This is a big enough issue to deal with. And what's I think really interesting is the way that he actually solved it. So I'll share the way he solved it with you. They couldn't figure out how to keep the engine on, and they had no idea why it was shutting off. So what they did was they put a sensor that when one shut off, the other one would shut off too. That way it would just keep going at 2,000 miles per hour, and then the guy can restart the engines and he didn't hit his head on the side. Kind of interesting thing. Um, there is one in uh, Riverside. Oh, there's my children. Oh, okay, go on to the next plane. All right, how'd they get in there? All right, so, <laughs> so big scale, kind of fun, fun story. Back to chairs. Well, there's a, there's a chair in the plane, so. Okay, so back to chairs. Back to chairs. So um, if you ever come to a time in your life when you are novice at something or you're brand new at something, take advantage as much as you can because you're going to have a fresh perspective that you don't get later. You will never have a fresh perspective again. So when I first started OM, I didn't know anything about task chairs. So I went into our showroom and basically just started playing with all these chairs for the very first time. And one of the things I came across was as a brand new user trying to figure out how to do this stuff, right? 
um, not knowing what the controls were, um, there was a lever down on the right side that helped you move the arm in and out. Really simple, you lift it up, you move it, and you let go. It was metal, it was kind of sharp, maybe. If you got the lever stuck between positions, it would rattle, kind of sound like it was broken. And they had this thing for a decade, maybe, right? And no one really said anything, you just kind of move on. And I, I basically said, hey, let's fix this. Let's do this, let's fix this. And that was a, a design that we ended up using now on all of our arms and all of our chairs. Because I tried to have, in a way, if you will, even on the small scale, compassion for the user in our chair without them really even knowing it, right? It was like trying to solve that problem before they had the problem. So that also leads us to, remember, so I talked about Worksy. This was the very first prototype of Worksy. Um, Worksy is designed by uh, Henner Johns, amazing designer. He designed the swapper. I don't know if you've heard of that before, but he designed this chair, and he loved all the angular shapes up at, top, up at the top and in the arm. Well, that ledge back there was something we wanted people to use, whether it's with their arm or lean against. And we realized, wow, that sharp edge is a really bad idea, right? Someone's going to hurt themselves, right? So we actually had to spend a lot of time fixing that one shape. And it created quite a bit of conflict because it was actually really hard to do in CAD to get that just right. So we took a lot of time and a lot of effort to really make that a ribbon going all the way through the design and make that contour so it would work. There was a, another issue too with molding wood over the top of that, which is there's a wood liner inside. There's a certain radius you can have and can't have, otherwise it breaks. But that was all kind of part of that design. So I did not design this chair, but if you ask me what my favorite part is, it's this little section, this little two inch section right here on the chair. It's my favorite part of the chair. Um, so that's worksy. That's kind of one, one story. So back to, back to Ginny. Okay, so Ginny, like I said, is a year and a half. A lot of work went into it. Um, all the way through to the photo shoot at the end and the marketing and, and the branding of it and everything. And it's, it's basically, again, like I said, this really simple idea and simple design, which is tough to sell to someone that you put, put a lot of time and effort and work into it. Um, so many prototypes, so much testing. We have machines that can destroy things in our factory. So we literally put chains on it, pull it till it blows off, see what that weight was, was it strong enough? There's all these regulations, it's really amazing. A lot of stuff to do with the arms. Um, this was the, you know, this the final, final take on it. We, we wanted to design it in such a way that it could expand in the future so that we can ha have different seat widths. So again, the, something that seemed so simple ended up being so challenging and so hard um, to accomplish and to, to do. And everything again from the ground up, right? Um, we ended up then, we ended up then obviously going, taking pictures, doing the whole marketing campaign for it. We're at big trade show showing the chair. So this is our trade show um, in Neocon in Chicago. It's a big one every year. And we're showing Ginny and I'm all excited. And in comes, it's busy. The booth is busy, it's not this. And in comes a gentleman, um, big personality, and he sits down and he starts just railing on the chair, how uncomfortable it is. He doesn't know who I am, I don't know who he is. And it just like hurts. I'm like, oh stop, please stop. I don't know what's going on. I was just so like distraught, right? And I guess that feeling never goes away. So even when you're in school and someone rails on your thing, that feeling will never go away, sorry. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, this is crazy. Like we put so much time and effort into this. Who is this guy? Like what the, who is this guy? And just so much like internal conflict, right? Well, like two hours later, I'm walking somewhere else, just gotta get some air and I'm walking. And all of a sudden, I realized the reason he was there was because he actually, I found out later, he actually was one of our biggest fans. He actually cared probably the most about OM. And he wanted to voice his opinion and make sure everybody heard it because he, his expectation was so high from seeing imagery and seeing everything that, where he was so excited to get this chair, it didn't meet his expectation. And once I kind of had the realization of like, oh, this is his perspective, there was my perspective, he didn't know who I was at the time, ended up meeting him, kind of telling him the story, and now it's like, I love talking to him. Dude is so real, guy shares his opinions like that, and it's great. And it's something that I think I could have carried with me for a long time that would have been really hurtful <laughs> in a way, but I took that idea and that, that idea of like, well, let's have compassion, look at his viewpoint, where, where would I be with that, and how do you move forward? Use that as like a, a impetus to move forward, right? Okay, so 
This is a chair, two chairs, um, designed by Jean Prouveau uh, in France. Uh, he was an amazing architect and designer. Um, he was born in 1901. He lived through uh, both world wars. Uh, he's part of the French resistance. This was designed in the 50s, so after the wars, right, both wars. This chair is an interesting representation of what he thought the future should be. So it's a, it's a student desk. During, uh, uh, Germany, in Germany, during World War II, there was this idea that you were supposed to tell on your neighbor. You were supposed to snitch on everybody. There was no trust. Everyone was looking over their shoulder, right? That's just part of the culture that they were, environment they were in. And after the war, this was his response to that, to basically say, hey, next generation, you can be next to each other, you can now trust each other, you can now move and grow and go forward and not worry about that. And this was his response to that. So I think that's a really fascinating idea and execution. Um, this is a finished version of it. This is in MoMA. Uh, so it's, a, it's an interesting story, a great story about where he saw a lot of conflict, maybe on a giant, on a giant scale, obviously, right? And how he could have compassion for the next user the next person. So then I'm walking through a trade show in, in Germany uh, last year and I see this. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I feel like I've seen this before. This is from Ex uh, Extremis um, in Belgium. And this is a, a cafe table and chairs. And obviously the thing that strikes me the most is that th both chairs are sitting like a park bench, right? They're both kind of facing the same direction, but it's a two seater. And so you're obviously there very close with the other person, kind of intimately close. Maybe Europe's different, you do sit next to each other uh, randomly, but in this instance here, right, it's two chairs that are really close together. I thought that was kind of interesting. So I started looking at it a little bit more. Really fascinating design, actually. That little cutout in the front is for this awesome little table they have for serving things. But it's also stacks, which is pretty incredible to think that this thing stacks, which is very necessary for a cafe. So, What's interesting about this and the marketing of this, and I want to get it right, so I'm not going to... Okay, so this thing is called Bistro, and this company, everything they do, they say, is tools for togetherness. That's kind of their motto, right? Um, and the idea behind this chair, or these chairs, uh, their, their phrase is this, maybe love is not about looking at each other, but about looking in the same direction. I thought, wow, that's deep for a chair. <laughs> <laughs> but isn't that kind of interesting that that's really where that came from and that whole idea? Um, and maybe it is about looking in the same direction, right? So I thought that was a cool execution of that. So this is how my thought process has now come through into design. And I'm taking what I do in life and kind of applying it in design. It's all just overlapping now after being out of school. Um, so basically, no matter what you get yourself into, no matter what you do, maybe that can be a thought process that you use as well. So, thank you. Is there anything particular or things from your time in school that you continue to take with you that you were surprised you even remembered or things that kind of continually come back to you? Oh, the first thing that comes to mind is how great it is to go first in something during presentations. And this is first tonight for the whole thing. So the bar can be anywhere. There's no bar. <laughs> That's great. Um, I, I mean, I guess nothing too specific per se. Um, I, I think, though, that looking back on my time uh, in school, there's this idea that well, you don't really know how long something should take. They just tell you this is when it's due. And things are done only really when they're due, right? That's just kind of the way it goes. Um, or they're not done ever, right? Because you, you could always con you know, fix it. So then taking kind of like the idea in school of like, well, I almost wish I would have really had a better use of that time and understood what I could have done with it because now I look back and I'm like, man, I did not take that time you know, wisely, use that time wisely. And this isn't a plug, he didn't pay me to say this. Um, 
But that's really kind of what it is. I mean, as you progress and as you get into the industry, you see really how productive you can be when the fire is lit constantly over and over and over again, all of a sudden. And what it really is, is making decisions. If you can make decisions faster, you can do things faster. But we're all too scared to make decisions. And now I'm kind of the point where, like, I'll joke with my boss like I'm redlining. And what I mean is I'm, I have, like, decision fatigue. I'm making too many decisions constantly that's like, man, I hope these are right. Because it's just, we got to make the next one and go, and you just you, you pump. Um, but that's kind of, I think, what it was in school, is I wish I could make decisions faster um, going, through, going through the program. Do you have a favorite chair, type of chair? Type of chair? Mm -hmm. Favorite type of chair? I don't know. I mean, there's, it's weird. It's actually, there's so much in that world um, of seating. I think as I'm learning now too more and more in the industry, okay, so chairs, like I said, we think maybe older than the wheel, right? So everyone's used to them. So it's how do you take something like that? And like, does the world need another one, right? Well, from a manufacturer standpoint, yes, you do. But how do you disrupt the market enough to be noticed? Right? And how do you make something new and unique? And it's, it's very challenging in that way, in that regard. So I wouldn't say necessarily anything specific. Um, every, every chair has a different level of complexity. You know, from an ergonomic task chair, which has a ton of moving parts and takes a long time, to you know, a simple side chair, to high density stacking chair that you're sitting in right here. Um, yeah. But I don't know, actually. I don't think I have one particular. What was the turning point for you from like transitioning from like a student to like becoming a professional? Am I professional now? Did it just happen tonight? <laughs> oh man. Uh, turning point. You know you're a professional when you've done a fucking Oh yes. Made it. Awesome. This was it. <laughs> there, next question. No. Um I I don't have a specific moment in time. I just know that every job I had, every project I had really ended up being a stepping stone to the next thing. And I think the perspective that maybe is more important to have is not even that there's a transition between the two, maybe. Um, but the idea that hopefully my mindset can be, I can be a rookie forever. And if I can have that mindset, then I can actually grow faster, hopefully, right? So I really don't, I don't look at it that way. I don't really know that there was like a moment in time, per se. Um, I mean, I have kids now, so I, I have to feed them and make money. So that makes you, I don't know. I don't know, how did that happen? Yeah, huh, interesting question, yeah. What do you think of the Eames chair? Yeah, so that was, the story of that is really fascinating uh, in its, uh, pr the production method that they used and the history behind their production methods, um, bent plywood, fiberglass, um, and then the fact that they used a lot of that for uh, the military, or it might have been vice versa, the, they used it for the military first and then applied it to the furniture. So it was really about, I mean, that was really thinking outside of the box for what they did. Um, and yeah, and so the influence is just obviously amazing. Um, but uh, the, just real quick to say one more thing too, my favorite part about chairs that have that kind of a legacy is that I think from a, you got me all over the place, sorry, but I think from a, um, a product development standpoint and wanting to be quote unquote green as a designer, what if there's the ability to create a product that has such a long life that you're not wanting to buy the next, 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 next thing? Right? Like maybe if you have one that's good enough because you like it and it's, it's so well executed that it's in your house forever and they're even more valuable later, right? Kind of like the holy grail. But that's still product design. That wasn't art, right? So that's kind of, I think that's kind of my favorite part about looking at some of those really classic, amazing designs. I mean, mid-century design, geez, 60, 70 years ago? 70 years ago? Mid-century modern, 70 years ago? I mean, that's, or longer, right, with Bauhaus, but yeah. Someone in the back, yeah. Wait, what is something you wish you knew like, before starting like, your, your design job? Like, that's maybe something that school has that didn't tell you? Like, is there anything that you wish you knew? It's, it's such a different world between the two. It really is. I mean, I learned so much uh, with interning uh, while I was in school. I got to intern at Black & Decker 
and then I interned at um, Faulkner Design, designing shoes. And I mean, I just learned so much in those environments um, that it's just a, I don't know, it's a different animal, I think, in school. In fact, so when I kept going, I told you I kept going back to the senior shows and watching the work go up. And every time I went back, <laughs> at, at first I was like thinking, wow, it's not good work. And, like, and then every year I was like, it keeps getting worse in my head. I'm like, well, that's not the case at all. It's that I started growing faster as a professional. And then I had to change my perspective and go, oh, this is, this is the work that's done in the educational system. And it's just, it's just a different animal in a way um, with the time and energy you're allowed to put into these kind of projects. It's just different than getting paid for something and making hourly you know, wages and, and presenting ideas that really have to succeed. Otherwise, you don't really get paid eventually, right? So I don't know if that really answered your question or not. But um, it's just a different animal completely. And I think it's OK to think of it that way. I mean, if you have internships, do you have inter you guys have internships? Yeah? Really valuable, right? Really valuable, not just for expanding your, your network, but just you learn stuff so fast there. Um, so you've clearly shown us your affinity for chairs, but was designing chairs actually your, your dream job, like your goal? And you yeah, yeah, it's just interesting. So actually, yeah, um, I took two uh, furniture design classes with Joe Riccio when I was here. Um, my last year in school, I won a competition um, with Wilson Art Laminates for uh, a chair design. And they actually took me to uh, New York. I got to just, uh, show in New York. And I got to go to Milan that year um, and see the trade show there. And so I think maybe, yeah, there was kind of this whole idea of like, man, I really wish I could do that. And, and having that, that uh, Joe Riccio as a mentor um, in school and as a professional, um, and then making a lot of contacts through him, through the industry, all these design industries are very small. The furniture industry is really small, like really, really small, right? And a lot of people just go around. In fact, the way I make a living and survive is I work for a manufacturer, right? So they pay me you know, a salary basically to work for them. Um, but the way most uh, furniture designers make money is through royalties, right? Which is a whole other animal. You gotta put in a lot of time up front to be able to, to actually have an income to live off of. Um, but maybe that's more of the startup mentality too. And I told you now I'm not a fan because I tried. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I work for the man. Kind of enjoyed that. Um, but, but yeah, I guess, I mean, uh, with chairs, it was kind of always a thing that I was really interested in and, and passionate about. Yeah. But also that all those jobs that led me to where I'm at now, like if I just, oh, I'm only going to do chairs, like I would have missed out on so many opportunities and growth through my career to where I'm at now, so. As people have various body and posture, I think it's very important to get lots of feedback from the public. Do you, do you have any events only for the public's feedback? Oh, interesting question. Um, huh. So, I mean, we, as a company, we exhibit at trade shows like a lot of uh, industries do their own trade shows. We have, we're in three a year. And the reason why I like going to them is because you do get a lot of people trying things out. That's kind of a really concentrated area to, to get feedback. It's a little bit difficult because usually everyone's in a really good mood and they don't want to squander the mood, except for that one, one experience I had, apparently. Um, <laughs> but uh, no, we don't usually. Uh, we actually. I mean, in a strange way, we have a very diverse office, and we have a lot of uh, sit tests that happen constantly. We're playing like chair rodeo all the time. You know, I do have the chair that I do like, so I've like marked it and made it dirty so no one will take it. But we're constantly swapping chairs out. Like I'll even do a mock-up, and I'll like the boss isn't there, and I'll go and I'll change his chair. <laughs> Not to whatever, but you know, like I want to like have him get feedback. And then it's funny too. Like he's in one right now that I I mocked up for him. And he's been in it for about three weeks, which is like a, a record. Usually, usually, it's like he sits down and he's rolling it back in like five minutes later. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of what it is. It's more just internal in a way. Yeah, which can become challenging. I mean, even it's a silo in a little bit. Um, but there's a lot of uh, ergonomic standards and dimensions that you have to follow that are just general guidelines. Uh, you're never going to fit everybody, but yeah.
Yes. Do you have any tips on keeping a good posture while you sit or stand for a while? Like God, I was just slouching. <laughs> Uh, jeez. <laughs> um, that's funny. So, like I said before, uh, it's, it's really more about the movement, if you can get it. So, you know, standing at least once, at least once an hour just to get your blood flow back. Um, there's, a, there's a key to sitting that you don't want to have any of your joints um, smaller than 90 degrees. You want everything more than 90 degrees for blood flow, right? Everyone's sitting up. Um, but again, it, I mean, you get tired of sitting up straight too, right? That's just exhausting as well. So I don't know. I mean, it's just kind of a general health thing and kind of mentality. Like I said, I do end up perching. I, I have a regular task chair, but I perch on the edge of it. And I do sit up straight. And then I'll catch myself here. And it's like, OK, I got to stand up. Or I got to do something different. So I've kind of trained myself to do that. Because you're going to get tired eventually. Um, yeah. Put a book on your head? I don't know. what. <laughs> Yeah. Eric, did bad chairs ever come to market? Like, instance, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. Well, I just told you mine wasn't comfortable. Oh, well, this one. Happened. So, actually, I came in earlier. I flipped it upside down. I was looking at it. I had recognized it. Um, Coalesce is the company. Uh, I think Steelcase owns them. It's an amazing, uh, amazing for design, right? Beautiful. Um, and I sat down. I was sitting for a while, and I was actually scrolling through my phone, finding it, reading about it. It's designed by... Um, Minimal, the firm in Chicago, has done amazing things. And then I had that experience. I was like, well, I, I don't want to slouch anymore. I want to sit up. So I start sitting up. And I was like, whoa, there's no lumbar support. And then my back just kind of went in. And I was like, oh, wow, this isn't comfortable anymore, like at all, right? So yeah, all the time, all the time. And what's crazy is there's a, there's a whole market that's architects and design firms that spec this stuff into plans because of how beautiful they are. But there's this idea even, too, that comfort, so, okay, hold on, come on. Comfort is really just the lack of discomfort, right? I know it sounds weird, but it's true, right? Is that, is, that's what the case for that, right? So, so when you sit in it, at first it's cool, and then he's like, oh, wait, this isn't. But maybe, maybe the person actually might spec something where they don't want people hanging out. That's true. That actually has happened. I've heard of that, right? They've actually like, hey, I don't want people in all my chairs all day, you know, lounging around. Let's get to work. I, I don't know what the case was with this one, but that has happened too. So, yeah, and it, it's, I mean, sit tests are interesting and weird, and, and you can't really make an evaluation in five minutes on something either. You really have to live with it for a while. That's why we well, do we've mock been things up. With these things for a while now, and I think they're horrible. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah, a valid opinion, and I agree with you. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you very much, Eric. Yeah, cool.